Hello, so um, good evening. I'm here, here to talk to you about how we can start to rethink and reimagine how we uh, design responsibly. So a bit about me, just, um, I'm a technical architect at Beamly. Uh, so I lead, um, I'm currently leading a team uh, completely reimagining how we build our sites, um, and specifically looking at the techniques that, um, where we adapt our site depending on the type of device that's being used. I've written a book called Beginning Responsive Design, um, and I contribute to loads of open source projects, it's just a few. Uh, and I use Twitter a bit too much. Um, I think some days I tweet 600 times. Um, that's when I'm at conferences. Um, so anyway, um, current, current responsive design techniques focus on mobile first. They focus how things fit on a small screen, and then they progressively enhance for large displays to provide a fuller experience. There, but ha there, there hasn't been the same focus on either the content or the performance of our site. So what we're going to do today is look at how we can rethink the way we design and build our site to give these the area that they deserve. So first up, we're going to look at how we can improve our site content and how we display it to users and adapt it based on the type of device. So to start with, I want to read a quote to you from Bobby Anderson, who says it much better than me. Content is king. It always has been and always will be. Content is why visitors visit your site, subscribe to your newsletters, and follow you on social media. Uh, content is the single most important aspect of your website. And it, 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 in order to consider it, we need, we, we need to know about the, about the content before we can start our design. So this involves getting the, your stakeholders involved and, and, and asking them to provide you that content early on. In, in some cases, this might not be possible. And in some cases, you might have content that changes frequently. But um, th this, this is about making a best effort. And um, you, you need to consider that content must work across a wide variety of devices. If we're looking at global statistics, you're looking at 65% of users are on, or, or, or on desktops, 29% on mobile phones, and 6% on tablets. But don't rely on these, these statistics to be true to your site. You should look, you should look at your Google Analytics and look, and look at your own usage statistics. So Beamly, for example, 91% of our users are on mobile. The, the, the first way in which we ensure our content works responsibly is to look at how we prioritize content based on the type of device. The first step to do this is to audit your content. So you, what, you, what you need to do is um, look, look, look at um, your content and work out the priority to, the, to your users when they visit your site. And uh, content does not have to be in the same order on every device. So this audit should be carried out on a per device basis. Typical responsive techniques have seen content prioritization being considered as an overall piece, rather than in the context of individual device types. In reality, when users are trying to achieve, achieve when, when on your site, will likely differ based on the type of device they are using. So we're going to look at an example of this. So um, it, it, for this example, we look at a restaurant. So on small, on small devices, they, they, they are likely either going to get on the way to the restaurant or want to make a booking. So we, get, uh, we lead with the phone number then, and direct directions, and then, booking, and then maybe a, link to the, a call to action to the book, make a booking. Less important information on a small device is sort of like menu atmosphere, which is, which is the content that might be difficult to view on a small screen. On large devices, pe people are likely sat at home or, or, they, or, they, or, or, or they are on their uh, computer at work. So th and they are wanting to find out about the restaurant in advance. So they want to look at the atmosphere and the, and the menus and see what kind of food they offer. Um, this is obviously important to people who have um, al allergies as well. So, and then they, they might want to make a booking, look at the phone number and directions. So I'm not a designer. So, um, Apologies about, about, about the design, but this is how it, how it might look on, on mobile. So if you have a look, we've got the, we lead with the phone number in the top corner, and then we have uh, information on how to get to Nanchik and book a table, followed by the menu and the, and the, the atmosphere. But then we, we, can, we can completely ch ch change how that looks on larger devices, and we, li and we can lead with, um, with, with, the, with, with the atmosphere, big, bold imagery to explain what the restaurant's about. Then as users read left to right, we can, we can put, put, go lead first with our menu, booking, and then getting directions. So to reorder content based on the type of device, what we can do is, is use CSS Fluxbox. And, 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 to and, and for targeting, we use media queries. So, so a, a simple code example um, is that uh, the, uh, we have a, an outer wrapper with, with two elements. Uh, as we're building mobile first, we've got mo our mobile content first, and, and, and then our desktop content. Then, our, uh, then we, using a media query for large devices, we can, we can then have a uh, user apply display flex to the wrapper. We want our content to stack on top of one another, so we use flex direction column. And then we, we, we use the uh, order property to specify the order of our content. So better content for desktop will say order one, and better content for mobile will say order two. 
the limitation here is that not all older browsers support Flexbox. So, and if you, need, so you, need, if you need to support older browsers, as there is not a reliable polyfill for, for um, Flexbox, it is, it's advised that you, build, that you order your HTML desktop first. So, that means, so you're, you're using your, prog your, your progressive enhancement technique to progressively enhance from the weakest browser, which in this case would be Internet 9, 9 or below. So if in doubt what about your user's priorities are, um, you should invite them in and ask them. You shouldn't, be make, you shouldn't make assumptions. You sh um, w and, and, you can, and you can show them your wireframe, so, so the ideas that you have in terms of your, your, your order. You don't have to build this for, so before, before you can get them involved. And, and another thing you should do is um, it, it, you need to ensure your content is discoverable. So on large devices, navigating a site is often really easy. If we take a look at the Sony site, for example, it's a very clear navigation covering the key areas of their business. And if we can't see what, what, what we want, they provide us an easy way to search in the top right-hand corner. Unfortunately, on the majority of smaller devices, navigation of a site becomes a lot less obvious. <laughs> if we're looking at the Sony site again, you'll see the navigation has been collapsed to, to a hamburger menu. And the, and the, and the search box has, 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 has been hidden, hidden in there as well, but there's, there's, no, there's no clear indication that it's been moved. So, there's, it's, there's no, so the onward journeys have been hidden. So I, again, I'm not a designer, but I've, I've quickly mocked up in, um, in Photoshop uh, how, how we might want to improve this. So we can move those items inside the hamburger menu back, back, back out below, below the, um, the logo. We've, we've, we, 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 can, we can then remove the hamburger menu and, and replace it with a search icon so then the user can quick, quick, quickly get to a search find the content. What this, what this has done is it's pried better onward journeys because they, they, the, user, the user can immediately, immediately get to the section of the site. It's also provided additional context to your users when visiting your site. So um, we, we, we did something similar at Beamly. So at Beamly, we found that users didn't understand the co what our site did and what it was about um, when they first visited it. But by adding that context in, our, in, the in, the, in a visible navigation, they, they understood our, what our site was about much more clearly. Uh, the compromi compromise here is obviously we push the content down slightly, but um, obviously the, the, the uh, benefits outweigh the disadvantages. Larger devices also have more space for content, but that, that, that doesn't mean you should simply hide content on small devices. Uh, if we take a look at the GLH site, they've got this beautiful map on, 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 on large devices, but on, sm on, the on, on, on the small display, apparently we don't need it. Um, I mean, I might be trying to use my phone to get somewhere, but we don't need it. But uh, what they could have done is they could have put the map is a, is a thumbnail next to the address, and, click, and click, clicking on it could have made it bigger. So, in, so what, what I'm getting at is we should ins instead think of ways we can change functionality to better suit the device. So I'm going to look at a couple more examples. So one, w one might be a series of FAQs. So um, on, de on desktop, we might have them open, so that the, the, the user can use um, the command F to fully find the content they want. Um, or, or they could scroll through it. But on a small display, scrolling is a lot uh, through that much amount of content can be quite challenging because it, it, because obviously the, by, by being by being narrower, it's, it's taller. So on, on our uh, on our, our smaller dis displays, we can we can collapse all the um, content into the titles, into the questions, um, uh, and have an accordion. Another, another common example would be a light box. So a light box li light box allows us to provide a, f a great experience. Uh, on uh, on desktop, by uh, not, we don't have to take we don't have to go away from the page to provide additional information. So perhaps a login screen, but but on small devices, um, a light box doesn't really work. There's, you can't really see the site behind it. Uh, it's not always obvious how you close it, um, and um, onward journeys are, are are hidden. So what you can do instead is show a new page on mobile. And a bit more complex complex example is a parallax site, where where we where we are using scroll, scroll animation to tell a story. But um, uh, quite often, the, technolo the technolo technologies um, are it flaky on mobile devices, like position fixed doesn't work very well. So we can instead uh, make, it, make the, it just simple stack content so users can scroll through it. So, so how do you measure the success of your content optimization? With all, all our content optimization, it's important to, to, to measure. So the first thing to do is ask users to test your site and observe them. In asking your users to test your site, you're able to measure the, their response to, <coughs> to how you adapted to your content across each device. Another way in which you measure the success is to A-B test functionality. This is where you actually have two, 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 two or three versions of, of a component, and then um, different users will render different versions. And then when, when, the, when, they, um, 
w when you measure the, the success of the usage, you can, you can compare the statistics for, for di different components of, of achieving the final outcome. So, in, su in, 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 summary of, in summary of content, content is king. And with, with based on global statistics, 35% of users not using a desktop browser, we need to be ensuring the content is optimised for all different devices. So now it's time for a cat break. OK, that's enough, that's enough cats. Oh, yes, yeah, so yeah, that's why it's crossed out. <laughs> um, so um, now, now we're going to start talking about type performance. So, so, so we, we've talked about how, how we display content, but we need to get that content to our users really fast. So what is performance? Um, so uh, if, if you ask Google what performance is, it, it gives you this. It's the action or process of performing a task or function. In relation to a website, performance is the measure of how long it takes to deliver the content to your user. So, so there, there are two key, two key types of performance that are important to a website. The first of which is page load performance. This is the time it takes to fully, fully download the assets to your page and load it. <coughs> the second is perceived performance. This is the perception the user, the user gets of the performance of your site. So this is what's, what's really important. This is, what, this is the impression you're giving your users. So we're going to take a look at the Guardian site to compare the two. So what you'll see is after four seconds, the, um, we, start, we can start seeing content. We can start re reading the text. At seven seconds, the images have come in. So we, that user can start reading that article perfectly fine. Now, we're going to go way to the end. But at 32 seconds, we finally get the, the page fully loaded, and the adverts has, has, have finished, uh, have finished coming in. But, but, but before that's even happened, you, we could have read the entire article. So why should I care about performance? So a responsive site is expected to work on a wide variety of internet connections. A user could be sat at office, uh, 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 in their office at work on a really fast connection, or out in the countryside loading the site on a, on a 2G connection, and they still expect to be able to visit your site. So like, last weekend I was out camping, I had one bar signal the entire time, and the internet was really slow. So I want to be able, I, I, and I expect those websites to work. Um, the, 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 tre the trend in the past few years, however, has been, has been the, the, pa the pages have increased in weight. So, 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 so since 2012, we're seeing a 106% um, increase in page weight. And if we look at content type, we're seeing um, bro bro broad um, increases across the board, except, except where we, we do see a, a decrease in flash because Apple killed it. Um, and, but the, and the average time that starts rendering is also increasing. So if we look into, uh, in August two th uh, 2013 to, to now, we are, we're seeing an increase of 34%. Note that it's not just your web page that can affect um, the, the time it takes to render your page. It can also be the, 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 uh, the, the, the device and the um, network connection. So how, how can I justify to my boss how I'm spending, spending this time on performance? Uh, so Amazon found every 100 millisecond delay in loading a page cost them 1% in sales. So, so, that's, so, so a big business like Amazon, that's mil millions of dollars of revenue. And, and, and Google found an extra 500 milliseconds delay in loading the search results. They decreased their traffic by 20%. So that's 20% less adverts they can show you. So what, what steps can I take to improve site performance? The, si the simplest thing you do is just simply optimise how you load your assets. Um, one way you can, you can do this is start to use the picture elements. So, so, th so because it doesn't make sense to load a thousand pixel wide image on a device with a maximum screen size of 320 pixels. And this is why th where the picture element comes in. It allows us to specify different images for different viewport sizes. So this is the picture element. It's got, um, it, 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 it encloses source elements and an image element. Um, and wha how the browser reads this is it, it goes through, 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 through each of these source elements until it finds a media attribute that matches. So these media attributes use the same media expressions that you use in, you use in your media queries. Um, and then it, if it doesn't find, it, find an image that matches, it defaults to the image element at the end. So the image element is where you specify your alt tag and also provide the default image. Um, so this is how it works in practice. So, uh, so, so as, you, uh, as the browser is in, in, in increasing width, it's actually downloading another, uh, another image. Um, um, browsers that support the picture element will only download the image that the browser needs. So if you are a small device, you'll, you, you're not wasting bandwidth downloading large images. And as on a big device, you're not bother <laughs> bothering to download the small ones. So to use the picture, uh, the picture element on your site, you'll need to include the polyfill, which, which is called picture fill. It was developed by the same people who wrote the specification. And um, 
if you, if, you, if you don't like spending time including polyfills in your page, um, this week it actually made its way onto the um, Financial Times polyfill service. Um, so that it's, on the, it's currently in QA, and then hopefully by next week they said that it should be out. So you have to just include the polyfill service in your page and then start using it. So another, so, so another thing you can do is defer loading of both the image and video to improve the initial page load. So the most common thing to defer loading is images. So this is the Beamly site and the Guardian site, both of which defer images. So, so and in doing this, it means our, our initial, initial page rendered um, is quicker. But in, in cases where, where loading assets was deferred, deferred, it's important to ensure a suitable placeholder in place. So back to the, those, that, those two screenshots, you'll see that uh, the Guardian has, uh, has provided the, sp the space for the image to come in. Um, that means the page doesn't jump when, when the image actually arrives. And what we've done at Beamly is we've actually put a loading spinner in there as well, so the, so the user sees something's happening. Uh, simply deferring loading the assets isn't, isn't new. It's been done by a lot of people. Um, but what, what people, not many people are doing is deferring the loading of content. So the co what we're, back to what we've, we were talking about earlier, content is heart of our site, but not all, site, all content is created equal. So where appropriate, we can start to defer the loading of content or even choose not to load it where it's not, it's not, it's not necessary for the device. So what we're going to do is have a look at the Metro site, which, do, which, do, which while the content's not great, they do a great job of, of deferring content. So on, on our small device, what they, what they do is, you, is they load the article. And as you scroll past it, what you'll see is that they, 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 they start loading related content. And this is infinite. They just constantly give you new content. So it's, it's, it's um, on, on a, on a um, large device, however, they actually have, a, they actually have space for a sidebar. Um, so what, 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 um, so that, 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 that sidebar content is the stuff that would have been underneath on the mobile. So because it so I in this case, it's, so it they deferred it. And then it, using JavaScript, they, 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 they pull it in. The, 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 the benefit being is, it is if that content had never been, uh, been viewed on mobile, it would have never been downloaded. So it, 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 it saves the user, user downloading stuff they don't need. Another example of where content is deferred is Facebook. So if their site isn't responsive, but the, what they do do is, is, is a really good job of rendering, com rendering components as they think you need them. So um, one of the first things that renders this is the search box. So you can start searching Facebook and finding content. Um, and they also then prioritize re rendering the posting box, because as, as, as they require, require you to post stuff to exist, to, 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 uh, they, um, they, they, gi they gi make that give you the opportunity to do so as fast as possible. And in doing this, that, that, that they, the, the perception from the user is that the, pa that, that the page is interactable a lot quicker. The biggest danger in deferring content in this way is that if your JavaScript fails to load, the content is deferred. So there's, there's a lot of situations where you might fail to have JavaScript. So you're, uh, you enter a tube station and you, you, you load a web page and JavaScript fails to load. You're on a train and you go into a tunnel, it fails to load. Or, or if it's just patchy signal. So uh, one that, again, not a responsive fact, the talk to a business site is a prime example of when too much content has been deferred. When JavaScript fails to load, the user has not rendered any content at all. They simply have a navigation to a page that doesn't load because there's no content. Um, <laughs> so we, 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 sh we should th th therefore be careful with what content we cho choose to defer loading. <coughs> oh, another thing I should have mentioned is if there's, if there's a JavaScript error as well, that also the content won't load. So it is multiple, there's, there's lots of situations where content might not load. So we've, we've looked at images and we've and deferring content. Now we're going to look at how we can um, optimize how we load our JavaScript. As early, what we saw on, the, on those pie charts was that um, in the past few years, it, JavaScript has become um, the, the, the biggest source of the file size of our site, with, with uh, on average sites having 299 kilobytes of JavaScript. So two types of, there are two types of JavaScript. Um, the two types of JavaScript <laughs> I'm talking about are critical JavaScript. This is the JavaScript that's required to initialize the page. So this might be, um, this might, this might be any, uh, anything that loads the main JavaScript. Um, any like um, rendering type JavaScript that, that, that does like like, br like the Pinterest style bricking and stuff. So what's, what the responsibility of the critical JavaScript is, is it, is it should add events to track how the user tries to interact with the page. So this back to the, the, the perceived performance we talked about earlier, um, the user, you want to make it so the user can interact as soon as possible. And, 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 and then because of the, and, and then um, when, when have interacted with something, we, while we wait for the main JavaScript to load, we should show a state. 
And then, of course, it's, it's the, the critical JavaScript is, should, should trigger the loading of the main JavaScript. So then we have our main JavaScript. So this is responsible <coughs> for firing any events that have been deferred. It's, um, it will any deferred event listeners which it will be replaced by the real ones. And then we include the rest of the functionality required for site to function. So how this might work in pro practice. So we took, let's take a look at the site. If I click that button, wh what's happened is it's changed its state. And then eventually the, the client side of jobs uh, validation has, has fired when the main JavaScript has loaded. The, the, the and then just look at a second example. So users started interacting with the page. And in the background, what's happening is, um, is um, the critical JavaScript is downloading the main JavaScript. And, and, and so, so when they actually get around to making a post and clicking submit, the main JavaScript's loaded, so they, they, they interact straight away. So, 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 so how do you achieve this? One way of which is, to, is, is to use a library called CriticalJS, which is available on GitHub, and it's also available on NPM. Um, you, you load the CriticalJS library, um, and you specify um, where your main JavaScript lives. You can then add a data attribute specifying the events have been deferred. So this is a, a, anything you can add with the add event listener. You can add in this data attribute. Um, and then in your, in, in, your, in, in your main JavaScript, you then need to handle it. So once, once the main JavaScript is loaded, uh, you, you, you need to ask CriticalJS if the button has been clicked. Um, that's going to return true or false. And then if it has been clicked, we can then fire, fire the method th that we're then going to attach to our button. <coughs> and then, of course, we attach the real event interactions. So um, we talked about performance. So how do you measure uh, performance improvements? So first, it's very important that as you, as you make changes to your website, you're regularly measuring the site performance and, uh, so that you know if your changes you've been making have had a positive or negative influence. The simplest tools... To the simplest tool, um, sorry, I thought the slide had changed. Uh, the simplest tool for, for, for this is web page test. So um, this is the slide I was expecting. So, uh, so with web page test, you simply enter a URL. You can select a test location, so where you, you should you should select a location where you, your users are, so you, so that um, you can get a reliable test. You can select a browser, um, and it's not just a desktop browser you can select. Um, in some locations, you can actually select stuff like. Um, for devices, so you can have like it's, you can test how your site loads on an Nexus 5 or an iPhone 4, um, and there's advanced settings which allow you to ch to, to um, configure like connection speeds. So once the test runs, um, it'll, it'll give you a, me a benchmark. So you have um, it gives you th these A B C A, a, a to F scores, uh, so it's like first byte time, keep it live enabled. Um, but for what we've today we've actually focused on start render and page lo uh, for loaded. So let's have a look at those stats. So it gives us information on, how, on how, how long it takes to start rendering our page, and also it tells us how long it took to, re to re render the page again, so when it's loading stuff from the cache. Unfortunately, my blog apparently takes longer to render in the cache than it does from the internet, which is a bit weird. Um, and uh, again, it tells you how long it takes to fully load and, and how long it took to fully load the second time. Again, I'm a, it's slower for my site for the second time. Bad ca cache utilization. So uh, we, we ha have seen that the benefits of both the user and your business to optimize the performance of your site. It therefore makes sense to focus on some of your efforts on making your site perform well. So in summary, when building a responsive site, we should be spending time focusing on the content and the performance. Our content should be prioritised and uh, in a way that makes it uh, that, that's right for the device and, and it should be dis dis discoverable regardless of the type of device you're on. And, the, and, and, and one of the most important things is the perception to, uh, of, of your site to your users should be that it loads fast. That you don't want you don't want them to feel it's a, a slow site because they, they, they'll, they'll simply leave. So um, there's a much more in-depth stuff on my blog, um, like notes and everything to do with this talk. Um, I'll tweet that later so it'll be easier. I, I have to thank loads of people because I this talk um, I, I I got loads of people helping with like uh, Cal Callum uh, McRae, Phil Nash, um, a few people at work, and my wife Charlie who had to who has had to put up with me rehearsing this in front of her too many times. Um, if you want to see, if, if you if you if you if, if you enjoyed this and want to help me see me talk again, I'm talking at half stack co half stack conf in November. I'm talking more about this critical JavaScript and critical JavaScript path. Um, and uh, or if you want to see this talk again, I'm talking. At, I'm going to give it for one last time at over the air in September. So thank you. Any questions? Concerning images, is there some? Um, is 
there's a particular technique or library or anything you would... So I, I, I use and contribute to a library called Echo.js, uh, which, which was originally written by Todd Mutto, but he, he, uh, he kind of abandoned it, so I kind of took it over. Um, that one's really good. There's a few other ones um, out there. Um, the reason I use Echo is because the API is really simple to use. You just put some data attributes on the page, in initialize it, and then if you add new images to the page, you reinitialize it, and that's it. Um, so, so the Echo is really nice. Um, yeah. Is there a particular event that it normally starts loading images on? So um, it's something on scroll. So basically what will happen is it will load all of the images that are in view, and then you scroll down to the f further down the page, um, and normally have an offset, so I have it that set to 1,000 pixels. Yeah. So anything 1,000 pixels below the fold will, will be loaded. So you just start scrolling and they don't actually realize. Uses like width and height tags to, or uh, the CSS. To keep the, the right positioning, yeah. Awesome. Great, thank you. Which shows that, which is another reason why width and height things are really important. Which sort of too many people expect them. Cool, any other questions? Hello. Uh -huh. So um, it's impossible to tell if they're on Wi-Fi, really, um, because um, the, 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 uh, the browsers don't really expose that to us uh, for good reason. That's you can't, that's you, we can't really infer much from that anyway, because a, a, um, a Wi-Fi connection could be really slow. It could be really fast. A 3G connection could be really fast. It can even be faster than the 4G. So it's, 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 you, it's, you can't really infer much from the type of connection. Um, and if you, uh, I, I, I was at when I was at EdgeConf, I actually went to the network panel, and they were talking about how that is about how like they could expose this stuff to us, and it's, it's very difficult. The network, because you, you have to like do like how we have speed tests on net for testing our home broadband connections. You'd have to have that running on every single site, kind of. So yeah, volumes would be useful. So you'd be interested in the latency. You'd be interested in the latency and the bandwidth and the reactions. Yeah. Yeah. And. Yeah, I mean, if you if you regularly browse in sites, you could uh, if, you, if you just browse another site, you could potentially have data in there in it. Yeah, you can actually do that yourself. You just have offsets and like just look at X amount of time, time therefore they can charge you. It. Yeah. <laughs> there is an API, isn't there? There's a performance API. Yeah, for yeah, the measurements, yeah. Measurements about everything to do with page load. And can that be spoken to by web page JavaScript? Yeah, or yeah. yeah, yeah. It's what Google Analytics uses when you see um, those sorts of stats in Google Analytics. That that bit of JavaScript. Yeah, it's, it's really cool. So, like, so, so we um, we use BigQuery to to look at Google Analytics. So soon we're actually going to start using the performance API to send stuff up to BigQuery, well, to Google Analytics, so that we can get out with BigQuery. Because weirdly, you can't access the normal um, Google Analytics performance stuff yourself using BigQuery. Odd. Cool. Any other questions? So um, there can be benefits of building separate, sep separate sites. The, the examples I'd give would be Google Docs. You couldn't, uh, it, it, that'd be very difficult to make responsive. But for, en for a standard website, it's, uh, there's, there's no reason it couldn't be responsive because you, there are CSS techniques and JavaScript techniques you can use to make them look completely different. I mean, I, I showed that, that um, Nanchik example, um, which basically um, completely transformed how the site looked. And that was just using CSS. And th there's, a, there's a very simple demo of that on that link that I'll tweet out there. But yeah, it's, um, it's, it, it's becoming a lot harder to justify building a mobile, mobile site. It's only when it's a specific appy type thing that you should do that. Hello. So um, typically, um, I, what I've, I've normally done is like, you can use a match media API to check um, to, 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 to you'd have a click event, match media API said, should I show a light box or not? If not, take you to a new page. Um, alternatively, you, um, if, you, if you don't want to use match media API, you could just check the width of the browser. Because um, obviously, match media API has browser like, limitations of like not being working out yet and stuff. Um, but yeah, I actually wrote a, um, have you ever used a color box, the um, light box plugin? I actually once wrote, wrote a, a, a wrapper around that that allowed me to turn it on and off based on the width of the device. So it's, yeah, it's, it's, it, it, there's also ways you could do it. Cool. What's that 
fonts. If, if your designer wants to use web fonts, they're stupid. No. <laughs> um, no designers here, is there? Cool. Um, no, basically, um, web, web, the problem with web fonts is um, if, if the way the browsers treat them is they don't, we don't want to flash of unstyled text, so they give you white, te white text. So, uh, so there's, there's some really good examples that I, t I tweeted before, like of the MSDM website. I was looking at some documentation for when matching my book, and it, um, I just couldn't get it on my phone because it finished, didn't finish loading. Um, so what I would do is load, load those web fonts at, with, with JavaScript and then store them in local storage. So then, if um, so, the first time they might they might get the flash of unstyled content, but the second time they won't. I particularly like it when all you get are the underlines from the links and everything else. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's great. So uh, I, I mean, we, we I typically will say don't don't use it for body copy anyway, because um, from an accessibility point of view, it's the web fonts don't render as well. Sorry, I can't, I, can't, I, can't, I can't quite hear you. So I know on, on specifics, you were talking a little bit about like the context of like the user. Oh, yes. Um, so uh, um, specification, if for those who don't know, is a forum where basically you're meant to be able to con help contribute to web standards. Um, unfortunately, it didn't work very well, as, as I found out if you saw that discussion. Um, so basically, um, I, I, I was uh, discussing that if, you, if I want to know the context of the user, like if they're using a TV, was, was the actual example I wanted. Um, but um, so, so from the from the uh, spec point of view, that what the, the W3C are saying is that we should treat a TV the same way as treat a tablet. Um, whereas I personally would say that it's a completely different type of type of input. So, and and the, and there, there there is in media query queries four, so the, the, there is support for um, detecting roughly the kind of inputs, but. Finger and TV remote control are treated the same, so I can't even use that either. Um, but so, so yeah, you, you can't read really to targets like TV versus tablet at the moment. I'm hoping one day we can. You can. Uh, CloudFront um, issued a new fix about a fortnight ago, where if you cache your site using CloudFront, then you get the header back to the server. That's that, that's, TV. That, that's user agent sniffing, though. <laughs> so <laughs> I know it works. Yeah, uh, yeah, I get it, get, get it works, but it's, it's not the ideal. I, I, I want a web standard that says that, that the browser TV should implement. Um, but this goes back to the problem that media types were never implemented properly, and media types would have allowed us to just do this, because there was a media type TV, media type Braille, uh, I think, and like all these different media types, and they've been breath deprecated now because no one used them. And like TVs were saying they were a screen, um, or they'd report it wrong and stuff. Is the screen supposed to be So you can only have, yeah, 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 and a TV is a screen, right? Yeah. It, 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 media types had that problem, that the, the TV was a screen, and TVs wanted to render websites um, that were optimized for screens. Uh, and because us as developers were putting only screen and you know, media queries, that's when we started to have problems. Um, but um, the, the, the problem with screen is, is and, media, and media types, is you can't, have more, you can't apply more than one media type. The, the specification says that you're only allowed to, set, to apply one, so if they apply, if they, they can apply a screen or TV, and if all, everything's optimized for screen, they're going to optimize. They're going to say, "Let's go for screen." Um, and, the, and, and and this has gone back from years, for years and years and years, like with the MSN TVs and all that sort of stuff. Um, those things that they had in America and over here. Um, that um, they support. They they didn't, they never implemented these media types properly, so they deprecate. They were, they were deprecated by the W3C. I mean, W3C's argument is that. Um, we shouldn't be thinking devi in devices in types, which why tonight I've tried to refer not to, to refer to mobile too often. We should refer to, to refer to them as small devices, and desktops should be large devices, um, and watches, I guess, really, really small devices, because um, they, they they they're trying to get us to think in the mindset of there's constantly new devices coming out, and um, we don't know what's coming in the future. Uh, well, that, was, that was someone else's suggestion, and he was like, no. Uh, I, so what I understood. Yeah, I basically gave up on that discussion because it was going for so long, and I kept saying the same thing, basically, and I was like, no. Yeah. I wonder if there's an API to get the actual dimensions of the screen in um, pixels. Because I could say that uh, 
you know, obviously, for example, looking at this screen, um, if it, it's three and a half meters, sure. um, either you have a lot of money for a really sweet monitor. <laughs> 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 it might be a but if this is a three and a half meter monitor, that's my UI might be the, 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 what I would do on that. The, the, the problem with that, though, is how, how a resolution does not equal screen, right? Yeah, but if you but, get both, you could always But a compute, say you plug a monitor into your computer, it doesn't know what size screen is, it just knows what the resolution is. It does, it just tells you what the pixel dimensions are. Sorry. <laughs> but anyway. There's something yeah. on that window that you can use to. Yeah, the um, screen will tell you what resolution it likes, but also what pixel dimensions it is. In JavaScript? Uh, well, the, the OS knows, but the browser yeah, yeah, knows. Yeah, the yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. I, don't think, I don't think it's exposed at least. But yeah, I mean, I, I think even there it can be flaky as well. I was saying that, 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 that sometimes you know, always know the size. I might have, I've, I've got a 55 inch TV at home and it gets confused. So, with these, these deprecations because of lack of use, is there, is there any trend in the positive? Is there, is there a reason to believe that in five years from now we'll have more meta information and we'll all be. So, we, get, we start, they're the, starting to do a few things. Like, I don't know if you saw recently, they've divided the ability to get battery information. So, you can see how much battery life someone's got. Which then, which then apparently can be used to track you in an incognito mode. So um, I think they have to be careful about what they do. I mean, you've seen those everlasting cookie things that have been done now as well, where they can like finger or finger computer fingerprinting you can do. But you can make it work up pl all plugins people have got installed in the browser and and then and versions, and you can fingerprint someone. Um, it's all that kind of creepy stuff. So I think they have to, I think they're going to be very careful about what they add because obviously this this is kind of fingerprinting stuff. Uh, what? It's kind of a losing battle. Oh, yeah, it's very losing battle. Yeah. Yeah, it's core some, yeah, that's core some pointer, right? But a TV has the same, reports the same one. Well, if it did, if it supported it, it doesn't support it normally anyway. But if it did it support it, it supports the same one, which is coarse because it's finger. Yeah. So, yeah, it's not, it's not that helpful. Yeah, and um, is that's and he, yeah, the, the one of his arguments was you use um, the viewport size because the the t is the t up to the TV vendor to set a sensible viewport size, but then that they should be set to the size of a tablet. But then I want to treat a tablet and it's too it something. Yeah, I think that's a uh, large discussion for Twitter. <laughs> Anyone complaining on Twitter just that that, that we need yeah, to be able yeah, to tell yeah. what TV is, or um, we could do what the picture element guys did and just crowdsource something and then build it ourselves. Pardon? Yeah, and you've got yeah, the picture element is the best, is the best example though because it basically they they crowdsourced the money and then built built the standard, built the polyfill, and then they then it's now part of the what WG and cool. Any other questions? No, thanks cool. very much. You can also ask me on Twitter anyway.